Great. I uh, trust everyone had a pleasant evening. I trust that you're ready for another good day of information, as I think we found everyone to have enjoyed yesterday, at least I hope. Uh, I want to once again uh, introduce to you ACS's CEO and Executive Director, Madeline Jacobs. Madeline? Don't go too far. Thanks. Um, I'm so delighted to be back here this morning. I hope everybody had as exciting a day as I had yesterday. It, it was one of those days where when it was 5 o'clock, I couldn't believe it was 5 o'clock. And we're going to provide another very fast-paced day like that for you today so that you really will hopefully stay engaged. I have just a couple of announcements before I turn it back to Ken. First of all, yesterday was really about, you know, some really very specific operational things about starting a company. Today we're going to be focusing really on, some, on external aspects of running your company, how you get the financing, what this all means. And we also have, I think, well, what is going to be, what I hope will be, a very exciting interview with um, Charlie Camarda, who is, uh, got the most fascinating career if you get a chance to talk to him at lunch. He's, he's really an amazing person and we're going to uh, have a conversation and take your questions. Many, many fascinating aspects about this astronaut um, that are also very, very relevant to entrepreneurship and innovation. At noon, before we go to lunch, we are going to do a couple of video testimonials. I've asked a couple of you to stay uh, at 12 before going upstairs to have lunch. But anybody else that I didn't speak to, if you'd like to make a very short testimonial about your experiences with the entrepreneurial initiative, we would very much like to have it. We are um, very excited about some of the things that you've been telling us about how this initiative, the training uh, program, and the resources have helped you, or anything that you'd like to say about this program. We'd really appreciate it. It'll only take a minute, and then you can go up and have lunch. And with that, I'm going to um, turn it back over to Ken, uh, oh, no, there's one more thing I wanted to tell you. You know we've been recording this, and you will be able, in a, in a week or so, be able to find this entire two days on the ACS Careers channel on YouTube. And there will be links to it from various other sites from our careers page. But I know for those of you who um, have friends who weren't able to be here, or if there's something that you just didn't recall, you'll have the opportunity to see it all on YouTube. So we're very excited about that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ken. Okay, thank you very much, Madeline. As I was putting the program together, and I hope you are as happy as I am with this distinguished panel, I wondered about a keynote speaker, and Pat Conflone came to mind immediately. So I reached out to Pat. Pat gave me a call said, Kenny, there's a problem for the 27th. I'll let him talk about that a little bit, but I, my heart sank. I said, okay, what can we do? But before I could even get those words out, Pat said, I have a suggestion. Why don't we make it on the 28th and I'll make sure I'm there. Um, I think you will find his speech very uplifting. I think you'll find it incredibly interesting. I'll say no more about it. It's my great pleasure to introduce Pat, um, and I know he would want me to be very quick about this. I'm going to try to do this justice. It's my great pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Pat is currently VP of Global R&D at DuPont Crop Protection. Pat is a graduate of MIT and obtained his PhD at Harvard under the tutelage of Nobel laureate Professor R.B. Woodward. After a postdoctorate stint with Professor Woodward, Pat directed his research toward the total synthesis of vitamin B12. Shortly thereafter, he joined the chemical research department at Hoffman LaRoche. Moving to DuPont, he contributed to the development of fluorescent DNA sequencing reagents employed in the Human Genome Project. COSAR, a major antihypertensive based on NGO tension to NGO antagonism, and I'm sorry, I am not a chemist, and Sestiva, a highly successful NNRTI used to treat AIDS. Dr. Conflone has presented more than 110 invited or plenary lectures worldwide. He's published more than 140 papers and obtained more than 50 U.S. patents. 
Among his many honors and awards at the Harvard Graduate Society Prize, the Alpha Chi Sigma Award, and was nominated to the Harvard Society of Fellows. Dr. Confalone is on the editorial advisory boards of Current Drugs, Bioorganic and Medicinal Chemistry, the Journal of Organic Chemistry, Synlet, Progress in Heterocyclic Chemistry, Synthesis, Medicinal Chemistry Research, Medicinal Chemistry Letters, and Drug Design and Discovery. He was elected chair of the Organic Division of the ACS. He's chairman of the ACS Committee on Chemistry and Public Affairs, and was recently elected to the ACS Board of Directors. He also currently, chair, uh, currently serves as chair to ACS's Budget and Finance Committee. He is on the governing boards of the Council for Chemical Research, the United States National Committee for IUPAC, and is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Pat was very adamant to be part of this summit, and we're very delighted that he could make it for our keynote speech. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pat Confalone. Pat. Thank you very much, Ken. It, it is my great pleasure to be here. Uh, the trouble I was worried about was being on vacation in Puerto Vallarta and wondering if I could actually get here uh, first thing yesterday. Uh, it turns out that was uh, actually what was a great concern turned out to be a reality. There was this um, mechanical failure on the plane and a seven hour delay. So I was put up Tuesday night in uh, Houston in an airport hotel of questionable pedigree <laughs> uh, in, in order to um, get here. I, I was able to fly in uh, yesterday afternoon. So um, it was a good plan, Ken, and it, and it did, did work out well. So uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk about the role of invention and, and how it relates to invention and take a look at the business climate and the employment situation and also uh, get to where the role of the entrepreneur is so important and in, uh, in, in, in has been important and will be more important in the future and, and why we, I think and, and a lot of us think that the time for chemistry driving startups and entrepreneurs beyond biotech and pharma applications is going to be in play for the next several decades. I thought I'd start with a quote from Bill Gates and Chad Holliday, former CEO of, of DuPont, and of course we don't know who Bill Gates is. Um, this was an op-ed from the Washington Post talking about innovation and its core force of vision, experimentation, and wise investments leads to thousands of breakthroughs benefiting us all. A serious commitment to innovation can be transformative. We all know the role of R&D investment and how ultimately it relates and creates jobs, a vibrant economy, and the quality of life. But there are really two steps that are major between that investment and, and the job translation and the, and the quality of life translation. And that is there first has to be an invention. But that is not sufficient. There really has to be true innovation. And, and, and that's, I, I took this quote from Wikipedia. It's, it's a, maybe a bit pompous, but it, it's an incremental, emergent, or radical and revolutionary change in thinking, products, processes, or even organizations. It, it is ideas that are applied successfully, and most importantly, to bring a value proposition to the marketplace and to society. And it's distinguished from invention which are simply ideas made man manifest and not usually all simply. So invention is a new composition. It could be a device or process that may be derived from a pre-existing model or idea or independently conceived, in which case we may be looking at radical breakthroughs. This quote from, uh, from Zent Georgi, a discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. I like Thomas Edison's quote, hell, there are no rules here. We're trying to accomplish something new. And we all know Emerson's make a better mouse mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. So one way of looking at this is that invention is the conversion of cash into ideas. But true innovation converts those ideas into cash. And 
I think entrepreneurship is uh, focusing on uh, the aspect of innovation. So for example, if we look at Edison versus Tesla, Tesla was a great inventor, spent a fortune creating inventions, but he was never really able to monetize those inventions. But Edison was an innovator, and he made money from his ideas. When I was at uh, Epcot, I was really thrilled to see this statue of the spirit of, of innovation, and um, it's a chemist. So I couldn't resist get grabbing this shot, but it basically shows that a lot of the world does see science and chemistry as a tool uh, of innovation. So the most important principle of innovation, invention may occur in the laboratory, but it's innovation that takes place in the market. Now, innovation is a very creative process, but it must include all business functions, marketing, finance, legal, etc., to be successful. So let's just look at a few quick examples of invention versus innovation to hammer home the point. I think we all learned in grammar school that Elias Howe invented the sewing machine, but it was Isaac Singer who really commercialized it and built a highly successful business. So we use Singer sewing machines instead of Howe sewing machines. Looking at um, the telegraph, uh, Sturgeon was the inventor who invented a device to generate electric current over a wire. Uh, Henry demonstrated it could be used for long distance communication by sending this current over a mile and activating an electromagnet. And he was able to ring a bell at the other end. But Morse, all he did, of course we all know, invented Morse code. But he combined all of marketing and political skills. The result was to bring the telegraph to the entire continent of America. Spangler invented an electric suction sweeper. Now, if you look at that, I think he needed a little bit of Apple-style design <laughs> in, in, in this, in this uh, offering. And I think he needed some interaction with marketing and branding and not call it the election suction sweeper. But it was really Hoover who knew how to market and sell the vacuum cleaner. So there's this index that's published of global innovation and the 20 GDP countries. And it looks at the innovation environment and it, it outputs as well as inputs. And so it's patents, tech transfer, shareholder returns, economic growth, climate, et cetera. And US is ranked number two, uh, just south of South Korea um, and uh, just north of Japan. Uh, but you can see that we're considered to be an uh, extremely innovative uh, country and, and an environment for great innovation. But innovation must be market driven. Uh, you have to be sure that it, you have the right market insight and market forecast to know when this product will be made available to society that there will be a great need at that time. So it has to be data-driven and always fact-based and stage-gated as one goes through the process to be sure that interim goals are met. And these days, sustainability-focused is really important. A lot of us in graduate school probably learned to do the work right. We had a project, we had a PhD thesis, but it isn't only important to do the work right, it's more important once one is in the innovation space to do the right work. It must be relevant, unique, and have a commercialization potential. So market-driven innovation really begins with market need. It succeeds, though, through intense collaboration. One must be intensely collaborative, not just with uh, allied sciences, but to be allied with all of the other parts that we talked about earlier on legal front, marketing front, business front, finance, capital. And it doesn't count until you get paid. I think that's pretty clear. So the critical dimensions are identify opportunities based on deep market knowledge, select the best opportunities for the business, and integrate with your core or accessible competencies, and then manage and execute the projects with the intent to win. So 
You can do the right work as long as it's, it's the work that's right later and get those both right and then resource them to win. They must be properly resourced because if you're in the right space and you're doing the work right, but you're not resourced to win, you will lose. And then you'll be back on the, on the invention, innovation, commercialization, and job creation and successful company uh, at, 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 at this point. Uh, there must be a willingness to change. I like this quote from Henry Ford. Businessmen go down with their businesses because they like the old way so well. They cannot bring themselves to change. And I think that's what entrepreneurship is about. It's about selecting areas that are ripe for innovation and, and not liking the old way so well and, and having the innovative process to take advantage of these opportunities for disruption. I have here just some of the notable innovators. Um, 1800s, you can go back to Charles Goodyear, Louis Pasteur, George Eastman, Charles Hall, uh, William Hershey and, and Burton, Catalytic Cracking, George Washington Carver, Richard Drew in 25. If you look at chemical innovations by decade, and I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but what I wanna show you with these next two slides is these are chemical innovations primarily. There's maybe one example of a pharma, HIV protease, I think, is in one of the later slides. Pharma has just a giant list of innovations, you know, each new medicine, basically. Uh, I try to focus on chemical innovation. And the point I want to make in these two slides is as you look decade to decade, you will have one thing that becomes clear, and that is that uh, chemical innovations by decade are going down overall. Going back for a sec, you see quite a few per decade. And, and it's definitely uh, clearly happening. But let's remember that chemical innovation in, in the US is really unparalleled in the world. If you look back over those decades of where the true chemical innovation was occurring. Now entrepreneurs have played a very important role throughout US history in commercializing innovation and creating jobs. But what about in tough economic times when the economy is burdened by a recession or a Great Depression? I'll take a few moments to just look at some of these. Uh, we certainly are aware of the Great Recession of 2007 and 2009, where we had global financial system on the brink of collapse. And unemployment at 8% and climbing, real GDP going down. It was a very scary time. So what what role has the entrepreneur played through other tough economic times? Let's see what history shows us. There were quite a few economic downturns over the uh, last couple centuries. Panics, at least three panics, I like the way they call them. And uh, recession, of course, the Great Depression. And uh, a lot of us may remember the recession of 73, 74, 75. In 1825, there was the first emerging economic crisis. There was a, a mania around uh, the South American Republic of Poyes, uh, which did not exist. But investors were buying and flipping the bonds of this imaginary South American Republic, uh, just showing what was going on. Uh, but at that time, and during that very serious panic, John Wiley started a company which led to um, uh, $1.7 in revenue in 2011. In 1937, there was unbridled speculation. Uh, there was expansion in banking facilities. Uh, there were government bonds. Uh, lands were using paper for payments, et cetera. That's when Procter & Gamble started, becoming an $82.6 billion revenue in 2011. There was a recession, as you would guess, after the Civil War. And that's when Andrew Carnegie, a Scottish immigrant, started Carnegie Steel Company. In 1907, public finance, a uh, public confidence in the finance system, that sound familiar? Had been shaken for decades. Uh, banks' runs were common, and there were prominent spec speculator misfortunes. And Charles Bard uh, created the CR Bard Company, worldwide leader in innovation and life-saving medical technologies. During the Great Depression, unemployment, believe it or not, was as high as 
thousands and thousands of bank failures. We know about the Dust Bowl. FDIC had to be created, and it really was World War II that brought the economy back out of this serious depression. But then stop Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, who with $538 started Hewlett and Packard. Uh, now, maybe this isn't so current right now, they had some troubles the last year, but they built it to a $123 billion company. And in the recession of 73, 75, these were startup companies. You may know some of them at this point. So even during deep recessions and depressions and panics, there's a great opportunity for entrepreneurship. But we do see the effect of uh, the more recent recession uh, on entrepreneurship. These are a number of establishments that are less than one year old from uh, March 94 through 2010. Uh, and you can see there were about 100,000 startups that did not survive the Great Recession of 2007 through 2009. Yeah, in spite of that, if you look at job creation, and you see it runs very high, and that's why we're so interested in supporting entrepreneurship at the ACS, uh, the jobs created are still substantial. And even in this post-Great Recession economy, startups still created 2.3 million jobs in 2010. However, if you look at the percentage of job seekers that decide to stop seeking jobs and start companies, it generally was running seven, eight, nine percent. There's the dot-com collapse back in, uh, 20, uh, in 2001. But m more recent data shows that we have the lowest annual average of this uh, study. Uh, so there clearly is, uh, is a lot of stresses and strains on entrepreneurship. Uh, in, in this day. Okay, when you look at the major trends, the great challenges that the planet is facing, uh, human health, increased crop production to feed the nine billion that are coming by 2050, uh, areas that are driving crop production, food, feed, biofuels, biomaterials, alternate energy, energy storage, safety, security, connectivity, communication, Electronics, the water problem, climate change, advanced materials, and the great growth in the developing countries. We look at these and we see an opportunity for chemistry that really hasn't been driven this hard by so many opportunities. We've seen all these startups in biotechnology related to pharma over the last 30 years or so. But I think that when we look at these mega problems, there will be great opportunities for chemistry moving forward in the entrepreneur space as well as larger company space. So, some of the more focused ones, more and better food, renewably sourced materials, alternate energy, safety, security, energy efficiency, and improved communications. So many important opportunities for chemistry. So how will we win this? We have the best research universities in the world. That is not going to change in, in the foreseeable future. There are vast sums of angel and venture capital, relatively speaking, for the US compared to most countries. California has more venture capital than any country, except the US, of course. A long tradition of science and technology-driven innovation and centuries of entrepreneurship leading to the great companies of today, as we've seen. So there was commissioned an ACS presidential task force by Joe Francisco. And in the background of this report, we had a few assumptions and realizations that chemistry was producing products that are useful by themselves and play essential roles in the products of other industries. 16% of the GDP in 2008 was related to chemistry. Uh, if you look through patent literature, you'll see chemical technologies are replete. And we know chemical innovation causes a cascade of new jobs that are not in science zone. <clears throat> Chemistry has historically been an important part of the U.S. base. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at U.S. manufacturing, 96% uh, of U.S. manufacturing is tied in some way to chemistry. <clears throat> there was a great growth in um, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, new industries and jobs in the U.S. has been unparalleled. 
Chemical innovation peaked in the 1960s, but has been in a decline. And the US chemical enterprise does not lack invention or creativity. What it's lacking, according to the Brookings Institute, is innovation. So George Whitesides uh, chaired this uh, uh, task force. And uh, there's a few of the folks uh, that were involved with this. Uh, Michael Levenfeld, I think, is uh, running around here. And uh, there's uh, the rest of the partners on this uh, report. So those are the ones to go to if you want to ask any questions about the results. But our charge was to explore root causes for historic job losses and recommend ways ACS can stimulate innovation and identify specific ways that the ACS can create high-paying, sustainable US-based jobs for chemists, chemical engineers, and allied science-based professionals. So that was our charge. <clears throat> the task force worked diligently and had some very key findings. The first was there's less disruptive innovation. And there's a difference between sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. Sustaining innovation, we see a lot of that these days. It involves existing products or services with better value, new and improved, as we often hear, but that's based on incremental innovation. Truly disruptive innovation provides products or services in ways that the market does not expect, and that's based on game-changing innovation. As I mentioned before, if you just look at the number of innovations per decade, it's definitely declining. And we have to really ask the question, why is that happening? Uh, now, there have been some answers along the line. Well, these are in areas that have been so well mined and thought out that, that innovation is, is just getting more and more difficult to do. <clears throat> That's like when the head of US patents in 1890 said, we don't have to keep the patent office open because everything that's ever going to be discovered has been discovered. So we don't buy that, that argument. If we look at so disruptive innovations, we see very little of it in, in later years. Uh, we see mostly sustaining innovation, where the improvements were perhaps significant, but most of the innovations re really resulted in minor improvements. Now, clearly, large companies need to keep the product line fresh and new, and product line extensions is very, very prominent. Finding new applications in adjacent spaces happens. Uh, well, all this is important, but we're just seeing a decline in disruptive innovation. <clears throat> the, another uh, key finding was that R&D expenditures are shifting from the very large companies to small businesses. Now, this is a very uh, instructive slide. If you look at uh, R&D spending by US chemical companies by the same number of employees, which will be uh, re directly related to the size of the company, you'll see from 81 to 2007, if you look at the top of the, uh, of the bar graph, <clears throat> that um, industrial R&D spending by the largest companies was cut in half in 16 years. <clears throat> but there's been a five-fold increase in the small companies uh, over that same time. <clears throat> so a key finding uh, was that there are about 300,000 U.S.-based chemist jobs have been lost over the last 20 years. <clears throat> this is a simple graph, but it tells the story. And I chose a red arrow to illustrate it. We've seen a steady decline over a 20-year period um, from 89 to 2009 of 300,000 based jobs in chemistry. <clears throat> if you look at the uh, US average of unemployment, uh, we see the effect of the Great Recession with unemployment rising to 9.7%. And interestingly, the uh, ACS tracks uh, employment or unemployment or underemployment by our members. And we tend, for some reason, to peak a year after the uh, US uh, uh, average peaks. But you see, we're running in the 4.6, 4.2%. And uh, historically, we've been in the 2 or 3% range. And it's much worse among uh, new graduates, where it's about a 14 or 15% unemployment rate on freshly minted graduates. And that number used to be um, more than uh, uh, about 
five percent or so. So <clears throat> this was a very key finding, and that was that startups have created the most new U.S.-based jobs in the last twenty-five years or so. And this slide shows that very well. If we look at net job change in startups, that's the top line above the zero mark. You see a lot of that light gray area. Uh, and existing firms are mostly looking over, over this large time frame at job losses. So this, this says a lot. It says that historically, and this was a surprise to the task force, <clears throat> historically that the large companies uh, have been shedding jobs, whereas uh, startups have been creating jobs. And th this is not something that's new. It's been going on a very long time. We know that uh, big pharma companies are in decline in an unprecedented way. Uh, for half a century, they've been the most innovative and profitable branches of chemical enterprise. Major employer of synthetic organic chemists, analytical chemists, et cetera. But the focus on seeking blockbusters and keeping 15% growth when you're a $40 billion company, that model appears to be broken. Uh, the value chain is disintegrating uh, and moving toward semi-autonomous, therapeutically focused R&D groups seems to be the trend. <clears throat> but what they're doing is really mimicking within large companies, uh, startups. Uh, so it's sometimes called entrepreneurship in large companies. Pharma is not likely to become a major employer of U.S.-based chemists again. Looking at inventing, but in not innovating in the way we've used it. Uh, we're the strongest university system. It's still the destination of choice for young chemists interested in research. And we have a lot of, of foreign visitors that come here for education. <clears throat> Our research lead over emerging uh, economies like China and India uh, are likely to last for decades. We'll keep that lead. But invention is not translating to innovation in most cases. So we're still very creative, but it's that innovation step that, as I keep, keep pointing out, is what seems to be uh, our fallout. Uh, federal government still provides about 60% of funding for academic research, and industry support kind of stays pretty steady at about 5%. So there's a lot of drivers for external innovation. Large companies, we have to focus often on short-term sustaining innovation, often at the cost of doing long-term long R&D or disruptive innovation. A new proprietary high-margin products have far less market life today because of the rapid deployment of competitive technologies. Uh, greater input, energy, labor cost margins are eroding and it pretty much creates a commoditization of products. Uh, large companies want to rebuild proprietary positions in high margin products, but or may not and probably are not innovating fast enough to compete globally. The conclusion is that large companies must increasingly rely on others for product and process innovations. Now the pharma model is going in this direction. You pick up the paper any day, there's a huge deal of some, something or other with a big pharma company taking a position, buying or getting a, a licensing or some other collaborative arrangement with a small a biotech company that's been successful. <clears throat> there's also concerns these days about access to capital. Uh, federal government remains the largest supporter of basic research. <clears throat> But support at current levels is uncertain. Uh, small business innovation <clears throat> and small business technology transfer programs are difficult to achieve, and these funding levels are also very uncertain. Uh, private equity has become more conservative, as we know. And uh, large companies are creating venture <clears throat> arms or taking stakes in venture capital funds to fund innovation at startups. So total or partial acquisitions, R&D partnerships, and licensing deals are currently held hostage by the credit market, markets and a continuing sluggish economy. So 
major conclusions from all this study. There's no intrinsic structural reason to believe that startups could not prosper in chemistry under the right circumstances. We've seen even in the Great Depression and all the panics, et cetera, that this can happen. Uh, there's an opportunity for a chemical enterprise to rebuild its leadership position through disruptive technology and startups. Startups provide a promising opportunity to create new jobs for innovative young chemists and seasoned professionals alike. And finally, there are major opportunities for the ACS to facilitate entrepreneurship and enable the creation of new companies and provide quality careers for U.S. chemists. So there were four recommendations from the task force. One, help entrepreneurs create jobs by facilitating more affordable access to key resources like information, expertise, and important services for startups, the areas of HR, finance, legal, et cetera, and a mentorship program of some sort to aid and abet entrepreneurs. Uh, improve the business environment for startups by advocacy of relevant policies, both at the federal and state levels. <clears throat> uh, partnering with academic institutions to promote awareness of career options that involve entrepreneurship. Perhaps a course in entrepreneurship in graduate school would be a welcome addition to the curriculum. Publicize the challenges and successes of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship in the chemical enterprise. And these were actionable recommendations that were given to the ACS. And that was the goal of the task force, to come out with recommendations that could be actionable. So let's look at some of the ACS responses to date. Uh, promoting entrepreneurship. We have all heard, I think, yesterday and certainly over the last year and a half about the uh, entrepreneur uh, training program for budding uh, chemical entrepreneurs. Um, that's certainly a very important part of the offering is the training, but as well the Entrepreneur Resources Center is an important part. Um, ACS information, key service providers, network of mentors, introduction to capital, uh, common IP and research agreements. In fact, uh, ACS received the Summit Award from uh, ASAE for positive change in America and the world. So check out our website at acs.org slash EI. And uh, I think we'll definitely keep working on this. It's going to be up for uh, uh, increased funding and, and sustainable funding uh, and very soon. And I, I am certain that this initiative, uh, because it has been so successful, will be uh, nurtured and increased uh, at the ACS. Uh, so that will be important. Uh, improving the business climate, uh, we had a, a significant role in the uh, America Invents Act. We, we know what that has done in terms of the, uh, the patent situation. And um, we have a role in developing federal laws and regulatory policies for the R&D tax credit reform, as well as an important uh, offshore fund repatriation incentives uh, to try to be able to bring, bring back some of the profits that were made uh, outside of the U.S. without in, in, in having a huge tax implication, which is preventing a lot of investment money coming back for investment in the U.S. It's a serious uh, issue with a lot of political implications. And we think startup investor tax credits is a great idea. So the business climate is an important focus of the ACS in, in this arena. Universities. <clears throat> I was also able to fortunately and thankfully be part of a commission that has been recently released its report looking at graduate education in chemistry in the U.S. And we clearly are partnering with universities now even more seriously and, and more broadly uh, in entrepreneurship and about five other topics that are the results of that commission study. Uh, but we really believe that a career option in entrepreneurship as an alternate career, still using the, the great talents uh, and mastery of the science that are taught in graduate school, and hopefully some broadening experiences in allied sciences, can be brought to bear with other tools, communication tools, 
uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, skills, being able to have some idea of what it means to be collaborative and work in teams rather than you know, head down individual PhD theses. So working with universities is another important uh, uh, effort. And public awareness. Uh, we want to give visibility to innovators, entrepreneurs, and those who encourage chemistry-based innovation. Uh, we can do this through awards, which we do, and through uh, CNEN. Uh, there was a special issue last year that was devoted to entrepreneurship, as you may recall. So um, looking at 2013 and beyond, uh, the entrepreneurship initiative is certainly beyond the pilot stage. Uh, the combination of our training program and the resource center uh, are going to be uh, uh, successfully uh, in, uh, built up and continued their uh, effort. We realize that this is a um, dendritic effect. As you create startups, they create jobs, and, and, and those jobs are, are not just in science. They're in other areas that uh, will be required to be innovative, of course. Uh, we have a chemical enter uh, entrepreneurship series, uh, ACS webinars, which are very popular, uh, chats, uh, legal basis, finance basics, and more in this series. And we have an outreach to Congress and federal agency through our um, uh, Office of Public Affairs, where we are diligently uh, having discussions and educating Congress on, uh, on the issues that are present. Uh, you know, the America Invents Act, et cetera. So I know a number of you have uh, participated in our entrepreneurship series. Uh, those will continue to be focused on that. They're very, very valuable and, and very well attended. And uh, we're, we're very pleased with the response on that. Uh, looking, uh, you know, for this year and beyond, uh, this is the ACS Presidential Commission I mentioned on graduate education. Uh, Bassam Shakashiri, uh, PhD, uh, President ACS uh, uh, last year. Uh, we examined the purposes of graduate education and research in the chemical sciences and the needs and aspirations of students. We conducted many listening sessions with graduate students at the national meetings, postdoctoral scholars, early career faculty, and others. And we developed in this commission recommendations to modify graduate education to prepare students for their professional careers. And that, uh, commi that commission report has been, uh, been released. Uh, one of the major recommendations is to look at uh, the ability to prepare students for um, alternate careers in chemistry uh, as well, uh, to give them experience in graduate school besides being tied to the bench with their uh, PhD advisor for six years, which we also recommended was way too long uh, for a PhD in chemistry. And um, that was a, a lot of discussion about getting that six year average PhD program down to something less uh, targeting four with an average of maybe 5%. Uh, we just see a lot of really bright young individuals choosing to go to a three year law school program or focusing on investment banking or or some MBA type of, uh, of effort. Uh, when the lore of science and fun of science gets lost in this six year program and you know, two year postdoc, maybe in a second postdoc with the current market and the job situation. So there's a lot that we can do to prepare graduate students for a, a, having a lot more options uh, and entrepreneurship and startups certainly is, is important. If I refer back to that one graph where, where we saw that uh, job seekers had turned into entrepreneurs and averaging about 7 to 9% historically, um, we're going to see more of that. And, and I think we need to give the skills and training uh, in graduate school uh, to be able to enable a fast start. And, and so that's one of the important conclusions as well. Uh, we, at our national and regional meetings, we have conducted a symposium. There's been business plan competitions that have been very exciting. Uh, there's uh, potential for startup and investor forums. Uh, we, we talked about the uh, uh, CNE and uh, n article. And uh, there are potential alliances that uh, are being explored with the chemical enter 
entrepreneurship council and larger innovators and uh, even sources of uh, private capital, both regional and national. So the future outlook for entrepreneurship, um, the American Invents Act, which changed the US patent system from a first to invent to a first to file, to great relief of so many of us that have been maybe involved in notebook battles to try to determine who was first to invent. Now it's just who's there first at filing. And it also hom homogenizes the US patent filing system with other systems worldwide. Uh, Jumpstart our business uh, startups act uh, will lower barriers to investing from traditional accredited investor requirements and will encourage this concept of crowdsourcing to financing startups. Uh, and there's even private crowdsourcing portals that are emerging. So we talked a lot about jobs. ACS has a careers uh, uh, component to the website, so I certainly encourage everyone to uh, look at uh, acs.org slash careers. Dave Harwell will be able to talk about that and, and I'm sure uh, privately, if, if not publicly, he does a great job in that. So uh, for more information about entrepreneurship, um, we have the uh, acs.org slash uh, creating jobs. Um, and uh, of course I mentioned the uh, EI, the Entrepreneurship Initiative. Um, I have to just thank DuPont for uh, my uh, years there as well. Uh, some of my thinking on the uh, innovation uh, in invention has come from uh, seeing DuPont as a large company uh, working and struggling with the uh, principles of investing in R&D and working through the invention phase and hopefully a well-oiled machine for innovation and creating value and creating uh, benefits to uh, society and the marketplace. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I was developing a little bit of a cold uh, over the last day or two after 10 days of rum and sun. So, so I guess I, I was owed that. So I apologize for a few times I was uh, uh, drinking some water, et cetera. But anyway, thank you so much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to give you this uh, talk this morning. I hope it uh, stimulated some the thinking and, uh, and, and also some advertisements for uh, opportunities uh, to um, engage uh, with the ACS in the entrepreneurship space. And the challenge is that one faces, but where one really needs to focus uh, the, the efforts of, of startup companies uh, tied to that market need when your products will become products and, and the, the road to get there uh, from the inventions that one always starts with getting through the valley of death and getting to the innovation space and, and ultimately to the commercialization space. So with that, I was hoping to leave some time and I do have some time if there's any discussions or questions before we move on to the next topic. Okay, good morning, is this working? Okay, good morning again. Um, questions for Pat. Hi, Pat. Uh, I'm Bob Quinn from Market Kamika, and I'm just wondering with the uh, additional focus on entrepreneurship and uh, doing things that are breakout uh, opportunities, do you see more focus on the market side of things for the chemical industry? I've, my, I've worked in the chemical industry my whole life, and I've always noticed a sort of a paucity of interest in real market research and where the opportunities are and how to focus on them and what the competition is and how they operate, that right. sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think the, the large companies in any given space, they, they know those markets pretty cold. So if I look at, you know, say, DuPont crop protection, we know those markets cold and we will start by looking at unmet needs, create R&D programs that in the eight to 10 years it'll take to invent and innovate and develop, uh, those will be timed very well for that. The, the more difficult markets are the ones that you're going to create uh, by your in invention and innovation. Those markets are not well, well known and so they're more difficult to predict. And, and th those are, are the ones that I think the disruptive 
entrepreneurship will have, have a major role. But I think if you refer back to that slide where we looked at the major mega problems, the, the 10 or 12 that are, are definitely all on the plate of everyone, um, and there's such a major chemical component to everything, you know, from alternate energy and uh, battery storage, uh, et cetera, that it's going to be very clear that the chemical industry, if, if not the large companies, certainly the entrepreneurs are going to be looking at all that space and, and tying that to the market needs, the unmet needs in those spaces, and bringing that back to where the invention has got to come and, and, and getting the science and technology packages that can get that first invention in those spaces, that's going to be important. So I believe the, the next several decades is going to be able to fund a lot of good, uh, good innovation in chemi chemistry. And I, I think given, given what we, we see around the, the, the VC world and, and also in the large and in, in intermediate sized companies, we, we do see uh, programs targeting these uh, areas of unmet needs. Good morning. Um, Good morning. My name is Boris Pekov, and I work at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was wondering, with the reaching out to graduate students to help foster entrepreneurship, have you has there been any thought about reaching out even earlier, as in late high school and in undergraduate? Because I feel like uh, I graduated in 2009, and there was a major allure to going to startups via uh, computer sciences. And I feel like that road pulls a lot of potential scientists away from chemical entrepreneurship. And it just seems like a very long wait to make these kind of radical breakthroughs for people that I think now are even more impatient than they were in the past. Right. Yes, good, good comment. And you know, clearly the commission that I mentioned focused entirely on graduate education uh, rather than undergraduate education. But uh, in, in the many days of deliberations on that commission, we, we constantly would look back and, and say the undergraduate experience, we need to, to get something in, in there as well. It wasn't a focus, but your comment is, is, is right on point. Uh, it, it really should start at the undergraduate level, and that's some of the discussions that will be going forward. Uh, but right now, even in graduate schools, you know, it's really um, a you know, PhD research program, and usually an individual rather than a team effort, and not, in most cases, very broadening and interdisciplinary, which is what one needs to do, whether it's an academic, government, or industrial science job. You need to work in teams, you need to work with colleagues in your own discipline, you need to work across scientific disciplines. So um, really like the differentiation between invention and innovation. Um, but I would like you, to, like you to expand a little bit on the need that you said. A lot of the innovation really happens when there's a specific need and that you need to be fulfilled. And you mentioned lots of things like battery technologies, solar, or, uh, and lots of the others. Can you expand a little bit more? Um, it's very. I think the larger innovations, like changing a solar panel, for example, is almost difficult for a small entrepreneur to do. But maybe something smaller that is achievable by them, is there something that comes to mind maybe in the two-year or five-year time frame that would be reachable? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, to, to be able to, to say we're going to go out and build a solar panel from start that's going to be innovative and, and, and capture the market, that's maybe beyond the scope of what I would expect to see in a startup, but what I would expect to see is a component, a materials component, or an improvement of an efficiency that's significant in one of the components of, a, say, a solar cell that could, could really be the invention that leads to innovation. And then at some point, you know, development of that and getting it into a, a module or a shingle or something would be uh, re requirement to partner with a larger company that has that skill set of development and manufacturing to get it to market. Hi, Pat. And I have more of a comment <clears throat> than a question, mm -hmm. but this could really reflect on your, your experience. And uh, I want to qualify this to say that I have a BS in psychology also that makes me extremely unqualified but lethal. But, um, <laughs> But anyway, so um, I worked in the industry for about 17, 20 years, 
And I was an, an inventor and an innovator, but I invented System 3 gasoline and new and improved System 3 and pure inox for uh, Lubrizol. And, uh, but what I saw, uh, and I still think is prevalent, and in fact, in the uh, Harvard Business Review just recently, in the March edition, they had an article about the managers now are playing not to lose and not playing to win. And so I think that's really been prevalent in the chemistry industry is that we're now, you know, the people who are watching over the money are playing not to lose. And so therefore they suppress uh, inventions or they suppress you know, these innovations that you're referring to. And that might be you know, part and parcel to why we're seeing the decline in right. the amount of innovations. Yes, yeah, so clear, clearly it's reflected by the less disruptive innovation data and it's reflected by the, uh, the decrease in R&D spending of the total pie in large companies. But remember, there's that five-fold increase in, in, in young companies uh, under 1,000 employees. That, that's where they're playing to win, for sure. Uh, hi, Pat. Thanks for your uh, excellent talk. Um, one uh, observation that, that uh, came, came across to me while I was uh, uh, reflecting on your talk is that uh, there seems to be um, a lack of um, interest to, uh, toward the Made in USA brand. I, I, remember, I, I remember back when I was growing up, and this, this was uh, this, this, the 70s and things like that, and there was a huge push, Made in the USA, and put it in the Made in the USA label. Now what I'm seeing is, is that there's, there's a, a demand uh, for new businesses but there's uh, there's the, the the counteraction of new anything new that's in terms of manufacturing and creating new products are being uh, manufactured and creating overseas. So the the stimulus for innovation is countered by uh, this competition of overseas market. It, it it seems like we need to get this made in USA brand back. Uh, what do you think of that as a potential for inspiring innovation? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great question. It's also what, what happens at the end of the innovation process, because you, you, your, your verb was made, and that's manufacturing operations. And you know, everyone in the chemical enterprise, we all know we, we've, we have lost or are losing our edge in, in, in manufacturing. It's driven by a lot of considerations uh, products are in, in a lot of other countries that are major markets, and so making them there, uh, the way Toyota might make cars in, uh, in Mississippi or something, that does make sense from that driver. But the lower cost uh, countries are another driver from the economic point of view. Um, th those are real important questions. And at the end of the innovation cycle, when manufacturing and scale uh, become important, uh, hopefully at that point in time, there will be more of a drive to see uh, inshoring rather than offshoring for, uh, for manufacturing processes. But that's a huge, huge issue that uh, uh, I think if innovation is occurring in other countries, there's very little chance it ever will be made in the U.S. So at least by having our innovation and development occurring in the U.S., perhaps we have more of a chance to get that done. But that, that's a huge issue, and uh, it doesn't seem to be going very well on that front. And, uh, I'm not so encouraged. I think the last 100 plants of a billion dollars or more cost for chemical plants, not one was placed in the U.S. I That's think we have time statistic. for uh, perhaps two short questions. And two long answers? <laughs> yeah, it's short. Um, I'm interested in this concept of uh, this entrepreneurship with inside a large organization. So some would argue that um, it's, it's about incentives. How do you incentivize people? And people go seek this out to, you know, for the reward and it, what we talked about yesterday. So uh, what's your opinion on that? Is it possible to create that environment? Yes, it is. Uh, there, it, it varies from, you know, large company to large company and the term entrepreneurship is used. Uh, and there are some examples uh, where, you know, there are groups that are given budgets that are, are told to become startups within the companies. Uh, there may be a group of scientists who, uh, it's not a part of anyone's program, but they can approach management and say, we would like to do research in this area because we, we have these great ideas. And large companies are, varying again, are funding that kind of effort. 
at the same time scanning the whole space to see where, uh, where the innovation is occurring. I mean, say DuPont has a $2 billion R&D budget. Working in a $200 billion R&D space worldwide, so that means that 98% probability the invention is going to occur somewhere else. Just do the math. So we have to be scanning all the time externally. But having internal uh, programs that look like internal startups, it, it's, it's a practice that varies from company to company, but it, it, it's present and it's done and encouraged by management that I think is, is, has the right approach to, uh, to, to that, uh, that concept. And one last question, I think. Uh, Pat, thank you for a delightful, insightful presentation as always. My question is about your uh, mention of alternate careers. What exactly do we define by that? I'm used to men and women good, doing some peripheral things like regulatory affairs and all, but what are some of the other things you would consider? Well, that's pretty much what we're talking about. Alternative career, to me, and the way it was used in the commission, is something that is not going directly from your, your PhD science to take that PhD science and do science now in, in industry or, or maybe in academics and in, 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 uh, government labs. So anything that's outside of that uh, be, becomes an alternative career, uh, be, you know, becoming a, um, a patent liaison or even a, a you know, patent attorney with a PhD. Uh, uh, work, working in, in these other fields. Entrepreneurship is considered uh, in this space to be an alternate career to going out and, uh, and, and, and having an intense uh, already set up job you know, where you work as part of a large company or so. So um, their, their training is just lacking in alternative careers and, and I think that's what we're gonna be seeing. I, I, I particularly, you know, there have been a lot of great success stories that people using their chemistry in other areas, uh, marketing, uh, even HR, for example. But it's hard to you know, tell someone who has a love of science and, and, and love of chemistry and have been working at, at the bench and, and, and love the, the investigative experimental science to tell them that you should think about an alternative career in human resources or something. Uh, but people have got to, if they want those alternatives, they need to know what they are and need to get some training early on so they get some experience that will tell them, one, maybe I do want to do this. Maybe it is stimulating and exciting to me. And if so, I'm glad I got the training. Also, that training may tell them, oh, I definitely don't want to be a patent attorney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, that voice held up, okay.